want to give you an overview before we start so you'll know where we're going. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, and I'm going to introduce panelists to you. We will have our discussion, questions, answers, and we will have a time for questions from the floor. Uh, also, if you find that there's a burning idea you need to ask while we're doing something, feel free to interrupt me, especially if something's not clear to you. I would rather be interrupted and have you understand than vice versa. Also, at the end, then, we'll have a time for ending comments from our panelists. So, <coughs> this is an overview of what we're going to do. I'm going to cover this, and then we're going to introduce the panelists. We, meaning you, all of us are putting ourselves in the position of being developers, designers for this period. Your client has developed a marketing strategy, and he's done it correctly. Research, experience, creativity, and it includes five elements. The product itself, distribution, pricing strategy, the target market, an advertising promotional strategy, which includes what we're going to be dealing with, the website. Now, you'll also hear, some of them will come back to you with words like positioning and a, a USP, um, a unique selling proposition. Every company you deal with, especially larger ones, they have their own vocabulary, their own way of expressing things. So don't get too tied down on what the words are. What's important is to get the meaning back from them. Now, our task will be to take the design we're going to work with and use that to reflect and sync with the marketing strategy. We're going to cover four elements talking about design three main ones. Now what I'm doing, I'm simplifying, I'm lumping things into simple words. Words is one, meaning copy and uh, topography. Pictures, which includes images, icons, graphics, animated GIFs, patterns, videos, all that stuff. Color, use saturation, brightness, transparency, gradients, all of that. A fourth one, sound, mostly we don't use, but this is becoming the era of Alexa. If any of you have a girlfriend named Alexa at home, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and we're going to take all these elements and bring them together and talk about a layout and all the time syncing everything back to that marketing strategy that we got from our client. I'm going to introduce the panel now. <coughs> On my immediate left, Stephanie Kolka. Stephanie began her career on the creative side as an art director and designer. And then she transitioned to marketing role with Oppenheimer Funds in New York. In 2015, she moved to Jacksonville and became an independent consultant. Stephanie owns CO3 Marketing, which helps companies develop their marketing strategy and planning. Stephanie has a BA in visual arts from Penn State. You can see her speak tomorrow at 9.30. Her talk is titled, Creating Customer Engagement with Content Marketing. Karina Craig, sitting on Stephanie's left, is a designer developer with her own nine-year firm here in Jacksonville, Open Sky Web Studios. Her company 
demonstrating by example good marketing, clearly states in its marketing strategy that it specializes in creating clean, effective websites. Two very powerful words. Karina is the backbone of the Jacksonville WordPress Meetup Group, and she's the founder and organizer for the now three-year-old WordCamp Jack. If we asked Karina to describe herself in one word, she would she would say teacher. Fantastic. <coughs> Our third member, Scott Mann. Scott is an Emmy-winning creative director, a volunteer board member for a number of organizations in Orlando, an SEO specialist, a certified Google partner, and a community advocate in Orlando. He's also the founder and creative director at High Forge, an Orlando agency formed in 2001 that builds successful brands online. He manages a team of designers and marketers to produce award-winning results. He is a University of Florida graduate with a degree in creative writing and marketing. He is an active volunteer in his community, frequent WordCamp speaker, and is into sci-fi, digital nomad backpacking. I had to Google that. <laughs> you can hear him speak this afternoon at 5 p.m. The title of his talk is, You're Fired, Now What? Okay. <clears throat> Our first question is going to deal with an assumption that you have gotten a contract to go to a website and you're going to approach the client to determine the marketing strategy. So I'm going to ask each one of the contestants. They didn't know there was an award. This is up for grabs. Look that. Yes. So the question is, and we'll start with Stephanie. How, I'm going to ask the same question to all of them. How do you get the real marketing strategy from a client? This is what I do every day now, um, now that I have my own uh, consulting business. And uh, it's funny because I work with, um, with startups, literally just whether it be um, fellow moms in my neighborhood who are starting a company to uh, larger companies that I still work with in New York. And, Sometimes uh, the questions that I have in my, um, usually I have a kind of an engagement questionnaire, um, and those questions along with a brand uh, story building questionnaire, sometimes the way that you ask those questions, they haven't thought about the company in that way. And some of them are, you know, really flipping it, and it's not about, you know, the, the, the brand themselves, because um, a lot of times people think about, well, this is what we're trying to do. And, this, and they focus directly on that versus flipping it and thinking about what does the customer need. Um, and the, these questions that I have um, are very big on the moment type questions. Um, it's very much about, you know, what are your beliefs and then how are you going to portray that over to the customer? You know, what are the values that you say you're going to add to them? Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, what are the three top selling products you have? It's what are you going to do to solve it? Um, what are you going to do to, you know, uh, help with the pain point? Um, those are the types of questions that I find are really eye-opening and really help me dig in with them, understand their brand, and become a partner to them in that way. Um, and then we can sit down and talk about how are we going to implement a strategy to get those values across. In the end, there are goals, there are business goals, um, but we need to first decide, you know, how are we helping? Um, and how are we going to portray that? What do, you, what do you do when you just can't get them to open up to you for whatever reason? They just, either they don't know. They usually don't know, actually. <laughs> um, it's a lot of brainstorming sometimes and, and, and making them put on the customer's shoes. Sometimes people have a hard time with that. Now, where does you work as a marketing strategist, a marketing consultant? 
most of us would be more developers. But so when you're doing this, you're able to charge them. Do you think that the other people, if they end up doing that, they should refer their business? They get someone like you to go in front of them, or should they learn to do what you can do? I think that everybody should know how to ask those kind of questions. Um, because I think, you know, as my background began in design, and that is why I am doing what I do today, is because as a designer, I always wanted to know the answers to those questions. But there was usually people in front of me who were delivering the answers. But I always wanted the opportunity to ask the question myself, because I would ask it maybe differently. I would ask, um, you know, just the way that I might ask the question, I might get a different answer. And, and that's something that, um, you know, I've been able to be good at is getting people to think, you know, even just beyond the box, just really thinking differently. Okay, let's assume that you had your own design creative team. When you come back to them, how do you explain that stuff that can be a little ethereal? How do you explain it to these people who want to put pins and paper and draw things and create? Yeah. How do you translate it? Um, that's the one thing that's been very, very, uh, a very big asset to me is because I have a creative background. Um, I'm able to translate business speak, what the client told me, translate it over to creative. So I, you know, I hire writers, I hire designers to help implement the strategies that I put together. And because I have that creative background, I can speak the language um, and, you know, maybe break it down, right? Because usually when uh, a client may give you information, there's a lot of acronyms. And there's a lot of information that might be just nomenclature to a company. Trying to boil all of that down and really give um, the creative people that I'm working with, give them the information that they need. And by understanding, you know, how maybe they think, it's easier for me to kind of, like, dissect that and boil it down for them. Okay. Karina, can I ask you the same question? How would you, when you go and meet your client, your first initial meeting that's beyond the number? Yeah, I find, I find clients... Don't, I mean, we have to remember that in our industry, we also have words. We, and our words don't translate often to our clients. So it's just like anybody here who has attempted to extract content from a client. Like, mm -hmm. that's like uh, something I hear over and over. is like, oh, I'm waiting on content from the client. Why can't the content, why can't the client send me? And I, I, I have literally found clients who finally say to me in exasperation, what do you mean by content? Like, literally, the word itself, content, is the barrier. And so when in, we, we have our own language. And so speaking with the client, trying new words, trying, uh, a lot of times uh, if a client calls me and they say, I want a website, I was like, okay, and I'm trying to, you know, it's, it's early on, I'm still trying to get a sense for what their company is, what they're about. And they'll be like, so yeah, so what we need is a website, and I'm thinking it's only like, you know, maybe four pages, maybe five, that's not too expensive. And I'm like, I don't charge with page, those days are over. Um, and, and then they'll say, and I, what I'm thinking, okay, okay, so what do you, let's talk about a little bit what you need. Well, I need, I need a slider. Okay, that's a decision we'll make later. Why do we need a slider? And then I can, if you can engage them in some level of getting off the topic of the website, that really helps. So I say, before we go into that, tell me a little bit about why you went into business. I thought, how did all this start for you? This is so interesting. And show interest back into what they're doing. What? Because they're not good at building websites. That's why they hired us. They're good at something else. And if we show interest in what are they good at, you will start to hear the words. You'll hear the story of the company. You'll hear the heart behind it, the passion. You'll hear the, the product selling points because they will start expressing it in story form just by having conversation. But if you become way formal with them and say, okay, can you send me the content for the about page and then for the product page, I need this and that, and then you need all these fields filled out and then they just freeze and then the project stalls. So I, as far as putting together a larger strategy out of that, I find becoming very warm and conversational with them about themselves. Like they'd say, everyone likes to talk about themselves. So if I can get them talking about themselves and not feeling like they're trying to talk website with me, because that's not their thing, that's my thing, um, that helps. Uh, yeah, so we well, it's a variety. Yeah. Talk to <laughs> oh, I touch myself <laughs> or my team because I do have a team. Okay, and, just yeah, and, and when you pass it along, um, th there is this sense of okay, I will say that verbatim they use these words and I'll repeat them. 
I feel this means this. Let's look. Let's talk about this. Let's balance this together, and 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 go that way. I mean, of course, we have to use our words internally, but um, I will flat out talk in terms of in the words that the client use because we will start to feel well, what is going on. And and I I'll say this too. A lot of I'll talk to developers or even you know strict designers. They'll say things like, "Ugh, I'm so tired of working with clients. I just want someone else to be client facing, and I will just do the work." And whereas I can appreciate that stance because they can be bothersome as far as their inability to say and mean the exact same thing you're saying and mean. At the same time, there is a certain benefit in always being able, even if you're two levels, one level removed from direct client contact, to be, you are building tools for people. Like, we're not building for the robots unless you're doing something really spammy. I don't know. But typically, you're building tools for people. So there has... Even the team members who are further down the line, if they need to have some appreciation for the everyday language that the customer is using and what their ultimate need is and what their, because actually it's not for them, it's for their customer that we're building it for. And, and keeping that in mind, we all need a certain level of people skills, even if you yourself are not directly engaging with the client on a day-to-day -day basis. Did you find some time to fire a client? Yeah. I fired. <laughs> but, you know, but for more other reasons, it's just, you know, not necessarily, if, if we're not communicating, nine times out of ten, I look at myself, like, what am I doing wrong? What other, how else could I reach them? Um, a lot of times, if, I, if I'm firing a client, it has to do with really unrealistic expectations more than communication or, or um, kind of an abuse of the system approach that they might be taking. So th those are, that's a totally different topic. <laughs> I, want, I want to insert something here before I go. I, I had a business for 20 something years and when about three years in we decided to fire a client it was when we first felt like we had a successful business because we were able to make that decision before then we struggled you know holding on to the thing you know. but it's a, it's a great once you know you made it to that point you know it and nobody can tell you you know it Scott same question uh, yeah as an agency, we approach it from, from a consultative standpoint. The, the interesting thing about agency work is uh, there's really only two general approaches. One of them is to be a boutique agency, which is when you're talking to most agencies in the work, uh, work camp and WordPress community, we're very boutique. We kind of customize solutions for our clients, and so uh, it's a very consultative approach and we're building essentially a, a custom set of services to solve a client's specific problems. So the other approach is to, to take what we're doing and condense that down into a process or a package. And some clients are going to fit into the process of the package and some won't. Uh, and it's two different business models, but the more sophisticated you get, the more you can choose which path you want to take. So. For the purpose of this conversation, we'll talk about kind of the boutique level, which is doing a customized solution. So the answer here is it's just asking an incredible amount of questions. And it starts with exactly what Karina said. It starts with where did you come from? What's the history of this company? Why was it born? Why does it exist? Why do you do what you do? And from there, where are we at right now? So tell me about your team. Tell me about the talent on your team. Tell me about what you're bringing to this project on your side. Who are the stakeholders? What is your team good at? So that, that part informs me two things. So now I've got their mission, and I have their verbiage. I have their words. And now I also have what they're capable of doing in-house versus what we need to be solving for them. And then the third piece to this, what we would call discovery, is is asking the client where they want to go. Why are we having this conversation? Why do, you, why do you need our help? What are you trying to achieve this year or over the next quarter or, or next year? Uh, what we're building together, what are we solving, and how do we define success? That has to be baked into the cake from the very beginning. What defines success for this project? And any time one of those three steps gets missed in what we, call, what we call discovery, the discovery phase, if we miss any of those steps or we don't ask enough questions in any of those steps, invariably we have 
planted a weed in the garden, or we've left a weed in the garden. And then we continue on with the project, and then we look back, and our garden is full of weeds, just from not asking enough questions. So you'll know you've got to the right place when, from a subconscious level, you and your team are, are thinking like that client is thinking and solving their problems before they've even thought about them. So don't stop discovery until you, until you have that uh, like in your heart and in your mind, until you, you've got that down. And as you go with clients, um, as, you, as you build your business and as you take more, uh, more projects on, you'll start to learn that there's actually kind of a set list of questions that will work for, for the culture of your company and, and the talent on your team. And, and at some point, you'll have a set list. And occasionally, as you get more and more confident, you may go off script a little bit, depending on the client and their specific needs. But yeah, discovery is key. And to get really practical for just one second, uh, everybody should be charging for that. One of the biggest problems I see in, in, in this open source community is people don't charge for discovery. It's actually the most important and most valuable part of your job. It's 20% of the project, but it is worth 2,000% of what that project is, is from an ROI standpoint. It's the questions you ask and how you plan that project that creates the value. And if you're just doing discovery for free and then giving them a quote that they can say no to, you have made a mistake. No doubt about it. How many people in here have, have put an incredible amount of time into a proposal and asked a ton of questions and then had that client say, ah, this isn't actually what I need? How many people in here? I'd certainly have to be a lot, yeah. Uh, that, you're essentially giving them a roadmap to take to a mechanic. You were the artist. They took the artist's work for free and now they're going to take what you did, did for them and they're going to take it to a mechanic for a lot less. And that mechanic's going to look at what you did and say, oh my gosh, this is awesome, I can do this. <laughs> but when you then have to or go and talk to your creative team, do you have to translate and learn, or are they already so tuned to the system that... So, so here's that's a great question, and, and to answer that, um, uh, we actually did it, we've done it two ways. So we used to do it where uh, myself or one of my strategists or project managers would do the intake with the client and do all the discovery. And then, and then present that essentially to our internal team as a, as a, as a kickoff of the project internally. But lately, um, as we're going upstream to more sophisticated clients that have healthier budgets, we're now baking into the cake the other creatives on the team. So even though our designer isn't actually actively leading a discovery meeting, the strategist is leading the meeting, but the designer is in the room from the very beginning, right? So nothing is lost in translation. They're hearing it straight from the client's mouth. And on occasion, when that's not possible to have them in the same room at the same time, we make it a requirement that the, the conversations are recorded. And then in the kickoff meeting, we make sure that a part of our design and our development teams, uh, they listen to those recorded conversations with the clients so that they're more deeply integrated in the project from the start. And we've noticed a, a massive difference in, uh, in, in how connected our creative team is. Uh, and disconnections with the client and miscommunications have, gone, have dropped way down by doing it that way. But it just requires having more people in the room, and so there's more cost, there's more overhead. So, but it, it's, the trade-off is invaluable. I think the ROI is is just off the charts when you do that, do it that way. I know this is not talking about design yet, but this information right here can be the most important thing you hear in this session, maybe in all of the but really crucial. It's very critical. And so often what you read about it is, can be very dry and boring because we can talk that way and make it that way. We do it. I don't know why. But it, it is important. We're going to go to our to our concept. Excuse me, our um, design things, and we're already going through our time. But we will get out of here. We started late. I'm going to go late, so well, somebody else has to pay the price for that. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to talk about what we call color words and 
pictures and maybe four minutes each. Karina is going to talk about color. And color is using it based on what you've got from those meetings with your client. What is the concept going to be, the strategy? How does that affect the decision of color and how do you actually work with concrete as you can be crazy? Well, um, one of the things, and I think one of the reasons we're breaking this apart a little bit, in an age where there are so many pre-built things out there, there's themes everywhere. And whether you're using a pre-built theme, whether you're building on top of a starter theme, whether you are building from scratch a theme, um, you know, if we're going to drive, what are we up to, 30% of the internet on this platform, mm -hmm. we've got to give some attention to the visual aspect so that we look awesome. Because I feel like that that's kind of something that's slipping through the cracks with a lot of the the more technical side discussions and with the, with the coming of Gutenberg and everything can be clicked on and changed and adjusted by every level of people who's there. Like these are these are discussions we need to be thinking about like the visual aspect and when it comes to color, um, I am not unlike Stephanie. I'm not classically trained in design. I I got it along the way um, and my process was you know. Know, computer science, and then you go up. Oh, I need design, and and if that's your path, it, it can be learned. I think I think we tend to, one way or the other, lead in our brains, whether you're more technical or more visual. But both sides can be learned to a point to be effective, and I and I do want to mention that. So when it comes to color theory and such like that, I don't have all the fancy words and, and stuff like that, but. I don't need it because there are generators and there are things out there that help me make wise decisions. I have seen so much dark blue on purple, I just want to quote. Like, <laughs> so when you, when you are talking with a client, you're asking for things. You're, you're getting images that come to mind, whether you're choosing pictures and someone else is talking about pictures, or you're, choo you're asking for logos and things like that. And extracting color from that is a good starting point but then also sensing what else is going on in their industry. And I'll even, I'll even Google their industry. I'm sure you guys do your own due diligence and research and see what are other people doing, what's the trend. If you, if you might want to do some sort of surveys and questionnaires and stuff to get a feel for visually which way you go. But then once you select some colors, I, I really want to put it out there. Use the tools, depending on your level. If you're classically trained in design, then you know how to find those complementary colors you know what works and what doesn't work. Um, if you're not, there's schemes out there to help you. And I, I do this a lot. I look at color schemes and I just love seeing what other people put together. So in the spirit of open source, there's color lovers. There's color.co with the two O's or something like that. And it's a generator. You put in one you like and you hit the space bar and it says, what about these colors? And you're like, ooh, that's an option. You hit the space bar again, or maybe those colors. And not that you're going to deal with those exactly as they are, but it is a starting point to get a feel for what is going on. So what I would encourage you to do is use tools that are available to you to build good color schemes that are complementary and not just say, the client said they like purple and green. And just go with that. Um, and I think there's a lot of that going on. Then in terms of accessibility, what colors you're overlaying, what's the, what's the degree of contrast that is, is created. Um, printability. I, I, I released a site and it had a dark blue font that was just very complimentary and looked really great. And then the next day the client pointed out that she was printing a page every day for analytics in a way that I didn't know she was doing. And she was copying and pasting in such a way that that dark blue came across and when she printed it on her printer it came out as light blue and she couldn't read it and now she's asking for black. So those types of things. I had no idea that she was doing that and that it affected my color choices. But I, 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 so that's accessibility issues. <clears throat> Not exactly accessibility, but usage issues. So I just want to, I want to point out that there, there are, there are color scheme generators. And if you are not great at finding schemes, please use them that are already out there. And the other thing is don't use, don't overdo it with color. In 20 seconds, would you, <clears throat> would you consider doing a website and just trace it? Sure. Sure, there's plenty of industries where that strong of a statement can be made. And then you have to sell to the client to unless they're pretty sophisticated. Well, maybe the client wants that. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that, would, that would be an industry-specific question and a client-specific question, you know. There, there's beautiful things out there that done in grays and blacks and whites, white space and those types of things. So that's, that's layout. <laughs>
just a quick thing with your phones and iPads, you can take a picture of a Monet and turn it into just what Chris was talking about. So those are waterproof now. Um, go on to picture. When I use the word picture, I'm talking about images, icons, charts, lines, shapes, buttons, animations, videos, slideshows, logos, tables, graphic elements, text, menus, everything that's not copy and photography and not color per se. Five minutes? Sure. <laughs> Just be sure you cover all of those. Yeah, let me just, let me just check those off. Of <laughs> um, you know, uh, with you know, focusing on um, helping people put together the story that they're going to tell. And when I think of, of marketing, um, you know, I really break it down. I mean, when I say I'm a marketing strategist, um, I would really like to say I'm just a storyteller because that is, to me, what marketing is. I just presented to my daughter's middle school. Um, about what is marketing and being doing what I do and it's about telling stories and when you read a story a lot of people need to learn through pictures. There are people who learn visually and people who learn by reading and then there's a blend of, of it. Um, that's the one thing that I've always been passionate about about being a designer is, is telling a story through how does this picture and how do these words blend together to get the, the story across and, and the, the point across. Um, so. When building um, websites, I mean, a lot of that, to me, content um, is, you know, it, it's creating a library to tell the story. I mean, that, con that those visuals are used out in social so that you create a connectivity with the, with the brand. Um, so that when you see those images again, when you come to the website, when you drive that traffic to the website from social, um, from advertising, you have that continual visual. Um, because I think people associate... Um, brands with the visuals they see. They see them um, out in social media and ads and then they see them on websites and that's a lot of what I do with my clients is, is helping them understand that path of make sure you have a continual um, way of your telling your story through, through pictures and through visuals. When would you use video and when would you definitely not use video? 30 seconds? Um, I mean, Video, I mean, the stats tell the story. Video is, is where it's at. Um, people don't have a very good attention span, so the video needs to be short, and it needs to get the point across very quickly. Um, so if you can't tell what you're trying to, to tell um, in a short amount of time, then I would say you don't use video. Um, I think 30 seconds. Oh, how short? I mean, it, it's never too short. Yeah, I mean, people's attention spans are so, I mean, 30 seconds anymore. I mean, if I see something that's 30 seconds, it better be really good for to keep my attention for 30 seconds. Um, it just depends, um, really, in the medium, of, and also where are you putting that video. Um, you know, if you're putting it on your website, well, if I come, if I get, if I get down that path of actually engaging with a brand enough to get to their, their, their website, then to me, that's a, a better place for a little more length. But in an ads and in social, like I, I want that quick because I want you to grab my attention and then I, I may start engaging with you more to get to your website to see more content that's a little bit longer. Does that answer your question? Good. Good. Got five minutes on topography and talking. So uh, the words on a website uh, or on an app that you build, at the end of the day, that should be informing the rest of the story. It, the, the words inform the design, the words inform the typography choices, uh, the story behind, the mission behind, what the client's greater purpose is. Uh, that's where it all starts. So we talked a little bit earlier about where a client comes from. So what can we do in copy to change people's minds. How are we convincing somebody to do what we're doing? Uh, how do we convince somebody to buy a product? How do we convince somebody to buy our service? Uh, what story are we telling them? Uh, people don't like to be sold to. People like to be entertained. <coughs> people like to feel an emotional resonance with whatever brand they're connecting with. 
So, uh, back in 2006, uh, I, I had just started in my agency, I had just started moving out of doing all the things myself. And uh, probably the biggest proposal I put together that year for a client, uh, we got fired by them within a couple of weeks because I made a mistake in thinking that design and messaging uh, were, were two different things and that, and that one could inform the other. And specifically in this case, the client said, I want to see your designs, I want to see your templates, I want to see, I want to see what this is going to look like, and then we'll, we'll work on what the messaging and the copy needs to be. And back in 2006, unless, unless you have some, some, some specific college education on this subject, uh, I honestly didn't know how to approach it. And so I, I ended up doing designs first, and the designs didn't really have a meaning behind them. They didn't have, they didn't have a mission. They didn't have a soul. The designs were super cool looking and pretty, but there was nothing to grab onto. There was no, there was no story to hold onto. So it was almost like this beautiful watercolor painting that you're trying to hold onto, but the paint is still wet, and so you're sliding down it. That's what it felt like. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we ended up losing that project right out of the gate uh, because the client couldn't see the vision of what we were designing. And from that day forward, we've always approached it from, from the message first and, and, and what's, the core, what's the core purpose of this client's thing. So what's the benefit? What's the, uh, what, what's the emotional story? I mean, pick, pick a product, pick a service. Uh, I want to know the why. I just want to know the why. And you can, you can, you can stretch the truth and, and, and be opaque in your story as long as I understand the why. I can, you, can, you can market to me all day long. I just need to know the why. If the why isn't clear, then I don't know why I'm there. I don't know why I'm watching a video. I don't know what's going on. So answer the why really, really fast when you're doing your messaging, whether it's for your business or your clients. Yeah. One quick follow-up question. How do you know when people are reading the copy or not? So uh, his question is whether or not you know if people are reading the copy. Uh, the answer is Hotjar, <laughs> uh, Google Analytics. But Hotjar is actually the most, if, if you're a visual learner and if you're trying to see a visual story, there's a couple other products out there like Hotjar, but you can turn on Hotjar for free. It's just a snippet of code, just like Google Analytics. You install it on the website, it goes on every page, and uh, it'll record 100 videos for free of people using yours or your client's website. And you can literally watch where their mouse goes, where their finger goes, how long they're on each part, and you can see whether people are reading or whether they're just skimming images or whatever the case may be. You can see how people are engaging with your content in, in almost a, a real-time fashion. It's a beautiful thing, and nothing can inform your decisions quite like seeing that in action. Okay, we have, this is where we're going to talk about layout. I promised you we would take questions. I want to do that first. And you can make them so they would have short answers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that, so I'm just throwing it out to you. Any questions? Right here. Um, so if I were to start a creative agency, what would be kind of like the framework? Like the things that you would have to for example, you guys spoke about process. Like, uh, I guess the intro, the, out, the middle, and the outro of, I guess, the sales phone, uh, lack of a better word. Are you talking an agency in that multiple people were working together on to, to do a term project, or as a freelancer taking on client work? As a freelancer in the beginning. Yeah. And then with the aspiration to grow into it. To grow with that. Okay. I think it might, that one might be better for after the session because this is a little bit more design marketing oriented. But like, yeah, hit us up like uh, afterwards. I think oh, any of we us can, could, we can yeah, talk to you about on, that. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> it's a great, great solution. All in the end. Okay, um, you guys spoke about why, and I was wondering if um, especially for the podcast, you guys have like a specific reason why you Uh, 
That's a that's actually a great question. I, did one of you want to hit this one? Uh, I'll I'll just give a quick answer and, and we'll throw it on. So um, uh, it's best to just talk about some specific tactics here. For example, so to answer that question, if you understand why somebody's on your page, because there's a why that goes both directions. You're trying to tell. You're trying to answer someone else's why, and then they're trying to figure out why they're there. Um, but if you if you know why they're there, if you're talking to the right person, if you've done your if you've done your homework, uh, no button on your website, for example, no button on your website should ever ever say learn more. It should be click here to get free pricing or click here to to answer this question that you've always wanted to know, right? So. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's uh, yes. I want to sign up for the newsletter, not not submit. It should never be submit. It should never be learn more. It should be very very specific to the person you're talking to, right? So that's that's one of the ways. But getting into very specific tactics. Yeah, things like that. If you're noticing things like scrolling up and down, and up and up, they're looking for something that they're not seeing. What are they looking for? Are they trying to log in? Why is that login button? You know, we've done that, right? Like, oh, they moved it. And, and you can see those kind of things and then make informed decisions on the change. Um, uh, a lot of times when I hear about a new tool, I will go to it. And before I even spend hours trying to figure out, is this a tool for me and read all their sales copy and all this gobbledygook, I like, just show me the pricing because are you even in my range before I start? Like, I'm very practical that way. So I'm like pricing, 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 pricing. And if that's hard to find, that's going to show up in, in their research. Unless if I see a button, it's marked pricing. If I see a button that's marked investment, it takes my brain an extra step to realize that means pricing. But if, I, if I see a button marked, um, what's this worth to you? And then I got like, I don't know. Like, you know, what it really wants. So, it, so you'll see, you'll, you'll see those kinds of conventions. Either they need to be there, or your in industry is so avant-garde you can get away with your own cleverness in your own head. But typically, that kind of stuff will show up and will inform them the layout. If, if you put the video that's the walkthrough to your product on the third page deep, but you're finding when they get there, which is very few people who got there, but what those who did, they watched the whole thing, move that sucker to the first page and see what happens. You know, those kinds of things can inform where, how you're going to lay things out. We're going to take and save layout for maybe a session next year. Yeah, I think we will. There's no questions. way we're going to talk about anything of value in one minute, but I want to give each panelist one minute to closing comments as they wish, and we'll just start with Stephanie and go down the line. Sure. Um, I think, you know, in general, it's just uh, you know, understanding what your what your clients uh, need. Um, again, you know, they're building, you know, they're asking you to build a, a solution for their clients' needs, but, but, you know, you need to understand what their goals are first. Um, understand, you know, what their products are. I mean, when you work with clients, I mean, you know this, you, you, you kind of have to almost live and breathe their brand a little bit to really get an essence of, of what, you know, what they are, but then what are those solutions that you're, you're building a website or an experience for. And in that, it really does come down to, you know, for me, a lot of key words are, you know, storytelling and experience. What is the experience you're having while you're telling that story? Because that is going to keep someone on the website. You know, how is the website interacting with all the other marketing tactics that are in play? Um, because there's just there's a stream of things that can happen before they get to the website. What was their experience before that brought them there? Make sure that experience continues all the way through so the story does. Exactly. 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 Um, you know, I, I don't have a ton of things except to say that the, when this topic of design came up, like I said, I'm not classically trained in design, but I'm passionate about good looking things on the web. In particular, that's what we do. And so I would urge us as a community to when you put something out, what, are you building a plugin? Are you building a site? Are you working with customers? Are you consulting? Are you putting stuff on social media? Please, please, please do a little bit of due diligence on the visual. And, and because I, the hodgepodge web is getting tiresome. And also the cookie cutter web is getting tiresome. And so, you know, we've thrown out tools and stuff and we'll be a, around and available. You hit us up in the happiness bar or whatever if you want to talk more. We didn't have too many questions at the time. But I, 
I would just say as a community, let's let's raise our game on the visual side of things because we're building great tools on the back end and sometimes I think that's falling through the cracks. Uh, I'll say that... never in his life talked for only 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can do this. Okay. Uh, design is marketing. Marketing is design. These things go so hand in hand, and and you can't take one without the other. And, and what happens is, is a lot of people uh, discount design because it's it's subjective. It's it's almost like icing on the cake, right? But when good design is applied to a good message, there is an exponential resonance there. I mean, it, it's it's magical what happens when when you have an engaged designer. Uh, on point with a brand um, following through as opposed to taking a theme that exists and is is separate from you know lives in its own cloud uh, and, and then you just stick some copy on it those those are very very different things and so look for opportunities to surround yourself with with both design and marketing talent so that you can more closely integrate these things and dramatically up the level of game and value that you bring to your clients. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters, is how much value you're bringing to the game. Christine, Karina, Scott, thank you guys.